as I read the text for this morning, one of the key parts, I'd like to do all of John 7, but this is a key portion, John 7, 37 through 39, and then we'll turn to Isaiah 55. This is such a moving part of the text. I mean, I hope to set up the scene. L- listen, you hear that? I want you in just a few minutes to feel like you're right here listening to Jesus. Like, like you're right in Jerusalem. Everything that's going on around. It says this, the word of God, John seven thirty seven. on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And then over to Isaiah 55. Listen to this same invitation from the prophet Isaiah. It's God speaking through the prophet. Ho! I like that. Ho! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, Come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Father, thank you for this text of scripture. It is powerful. You are making an invitation to us right now. You are promising that you will satisfy our every desire through Christ. Our deepest need, our, the aches and pains of our heart, satisfied and provided for by Almighty God, Jesus Christ. And Father, we spend much of our life buying things which will not satisfy, thirsting and finding drink that does not satisfy, when really coming to you, our greatest need is our greatest and ultimate satisfaction. Help us, Father, to understand John 7, And the opposition, the unbelief, the rebellion, the hard-heartedness against our, our precious Savior. And may we not align ourselves with those individuals, but may we, with soft and tender hearts, come to Christ for everything. We thank you for the gospel. We are in awe of the almighty Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. Those in junior church, you're invited to go downstairs as we prepare our lesson up here. You are going to have a wonderful time downstairs. John chapter 7. The thought of the gospel of John is following Jesus. We're going to find in John chapter 7, opposition. Opposition. Like, not made, we're talking major opposition against our Savior. People who are willful and deliberate and opposed to everything the Savior says and does. And yet, John is writing the gospel as an older man, maybe in his 80s or maybe even in, an, in his 90s. He's an older man. He's reflecting back on the life of Jesus and how he, as a young teenager, maybe 18 years old, was standing on the riverbank with John the Baptist, following John the Baptist, and as John the Baptist pointed a bony finger to Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John leaves, John the Apostle, leaves John the Baptist and begins to follow Jesus the Messiah, going wherever he goes, listening to whatever he teaches, eating whatever Jesus eats, 
sleeping next to him around a campfire. Um, amazing. And he is reflecting on three years of, of following Jesus. And I believe that he is writing this to challenge you and I as to who are we following. What are we doing with this one life that God has given us? Because this is it. We only get one chance. We only get one shot at earthly life. And we want it to matter and to count for the king, don't we? So this is, this is great. We, we, we've gotten all sorts of things from the Gospel of John. You. There we go. Thank you. We've gotten all sorts of things from the Gospel of John, haven't we? In John chapter 2, Jesus cleanses the whole Temple Mount, and everybody's concerned and, and alarmed, and he says, hey, I will give you a sign. You I will tear this temple down and in three days raise it up. And they were thinking physical temple, and Jesus was thinking physical body. See how Jesus is talking about a whole different dimension, and everybody else is thinking physical? In John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes by night, and little John the Baptist is, is writing about the encounter of Nicodemus at night, and Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. There is, you cannot get in, Nicodemus, the way you are. You must be born again. And Nicodemus is thinking what? Physical birth. How can I go back in my mother's womb? Jesus is talking spiritual birth, being born from above. Totally different thinkings, Right? In John chapter 4, he's by the Samaritan well, and a woman comes from Samaria, and he says, if you knew who it was who was asking you for a drink, you would ask him for a drink, and he would give you living waters. And the Samaritan woman's thinking, you don't even have a bucket and a rope. How can you give me water out of a well, right? She's thinking physical water. He's thinking spiritual life, spiritual water. John chapter 5, same thing. The um, nobleman is, you know, his, his son is healed. And then you have the lame man. He, all sorts of healings, great things going on. Everybody's thinking one thing, and Jesus is speaking of another. In John chapter 6, Jesus is talking about bread. Bread from heaven. They're wanting another physical meal. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you something better than the next meal. I'm going to give you myself. My death and resurrection. And just like God gave manna in the wilderness... So I now am going to meet every spiritual need, everything you need for all eternal life, both physical and spiritual. He ma he's made that promise. At the end of John 6, with a crowd of 20,000 people, they don't like that message. Listen. In John 6, at the end of the chapter, he doesn't give them another miracle of food. Why were, were 20,000 people gathered around Jesus? They wanted one more meal. They wanted one more taste of bread and butter. And Jesus says, I'm not going to give you the bread and butter. I'm going to give you myself. You guys, that whole crowd left Jesus. They left following Jesus. And now he's got the 12 and maybe a few others. And he looks at them and he says, do you also want to go away? Are you, are you going to turn from me as well? And Peter speaks up and says, where would we go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. We're here. We're here with you. We're not leaving. Can I say something? I would say most people, even listening to this message or in this room, maybe by the end of your life, at your last breath, will not be serving Jesus. The tendency is, with all the crowds that Jesus in his own human body spoke to, most turned from Jesus and left him. And only a few remained. I, I want to be one of the few. I do. I want to be one of the few. I don't want to be one of the many who says, wow, Jesus, you tickled my fancy for a little while, but I got bored with you. So we're going to look now at chapter 7. You're in John 7. The theme is this. Opposition is beginning to mount against Jesus. He is six months away from crucifixion. And the crowds are turning from him like you can't believe. We're going to find three groups of people that are... are in unbelief. They will not believe in Jesus. And there's three reasons why they won't believe, and I'm going to share those reasons with you, and then I'm going to challenge you, if you're a believer, you can fall into the same three traps. But I also want to set a picture as to what's going on in the text, why Jesus said what he said, what did it mean, how do we experience it? I have so many things to tell you. So let's get started. John chapter 7 says this, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. 
So he's very discerning. He doesn't want to go down to Jerusalem and Judea because he knows it's a death sentence. They will kill him. They want to kill him. Why do they want to kill him? We find out in the text because he healed on the Sabbath. That's why they want to kill him. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath, he worked. He actually healed somebody. He healed a man who was lame and paralyzed at the pools of Bethesda, remember, in John chapter 5. So here it is. It's in the fall. It's during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Bible says in verse 2, now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. In John 6, it was the springtime. Now six months have passed. It's September, October, and the following spring, Jesus will be hanging on the cross for our sins. So it's the Feast of Tabernacles at hand. Let me tell you about it. All right, can I put you back in Jerusalem? Check this out. The Feast of Tabernacles was the conclusion of the year's feast. There were seven feasts that God had set up for Israel. These were times that God was going to remind them of their past and point them to the future. We have many holidays. July 4th, 4th of July, everybody. We look back to what? 1776 in the Declaration, right? Of Independence. We, have, we, we don't have anything to look forward to except Christ, but as a nation, we, all of our holidays look to the past. Memorial Day, we look to the past. Um, Thanksgiving, we look to the past, the pilgrims and the provision, right? But, but for Israel, the seven feasts look to the past as something God did as he delivered and provided, but they point to something that is fantastic in the future. And the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the greatest, and it was the conclusion to the whole year. It was a feast of eating, rejoicing, and remembering. What did they remember? They remembered, whoops, let's go back. They remembered this scene right here. This is manna in the wilderness. They remember how in Exodus 16, they were hungry, and God provided manna, coriander seed, to land on all the vegetation. And then it was, they would scoop it off and put it into a bowl. And for 38 years, God fed them every single meal. And on Saturday, on Friday, they got two. So on Saturday, they didn't have to collect any. Isn't that amazing? Do you know how much food that is for two to three million people? Every single day. Super One bread store just flew all over the place. <laughs> and they're just scraping it in and eating it day after day. God is feeding us every single day. So the Feast of Tabernacles, they celebrated and they remembered God gave us bread from heaven. Not only that, but do you remember the scene when they were without water? And they complained against Moses. And then God said to Moses, listen, in Exodus 17, God said, I will stand on the rock. God said this. So Jesus is standing on the rock because God said, I will stand on the rock. And Moses, you strike the rock. Wait a minute. If Jesus is standing on the rock and Moses is to strike it, maybe who is Moses striking? Jesus. If he's standing on the rock, maybe he got his toes, or maybe he got it. Right? And what happened? Water poured out of the rock. Not just a trickle, not just a little river, enough water to supply the needs of two to three million people plus all of their livestock. Do you know what kind of flow came out of that water, that rock? as Moses struck it, this, I think, pales in comparison. In the dry, dusty desert, from a, a solid rock comes forth a gigantic flowing river to satisfy the needs, the physical needs of the people. Bread and water is what they needed to live. God also gave them light. He says in Exodus 33, verse 4, or verse 14, God says, I will be the, your presence. I will be with you the entire journey, and I will give you rest. And God came as a pillar of fire and as a cloud by day. Because we need three things to survive, light, bread, and water. Jesus provided all of those in the wilderness for all of those 40 years, really 38 years after Mount Sinai. Make sense? So the Feast of Tabernacles was this big remembrance this big celebration. It took place in Jerusalem. God said, you must go to Jerusalem. All Jewish men must go to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. Here's a little picture of Jerusalem. They have this model in Jerusalem, and we'll go to it. Um, it is at the Jerusalem Israel Museum, and behind the museum is this thing we get to walk around. But right up here, let me see if I can operate this thing. 
I have no idea. There is a place to do this. Oh, here it is. So right here is the temple. Here is the old city of David. And right here is the pool of Siloam. So during the Feast of Tabernacles, they offered many sacrifices. On the first day, they offered 13 bulls plus other animals. Then the next day, 12 bulls. Then 11 bulls. Then the next day, 10 bulls. And then 9 bulls, 8 bulls, and then 7 bulls for the seven-day feast. If you add up the number of bulls, do you know what you get? 70. Same number as God says are the nations of the world. Literally, a bull for a nation, God's death and resurrection in Jesus Christ is sufficient to pay this penalty for all the world, every nation. And then on the eighth day, only one bull for Israel, his chosen people. It's phenomenal. So there were sacrifices up on the Temple Mount. Then every day, the priest... The priest would go from the Temple Mount down this path to the Pool of Siloam, which is from the Gihon Springs. Listen to this. The springs ran underneath the mountain through King Hezekiah. He carved out a tunnel underneath the bedrock, and that's where the Gihon Spring flowed. Uh, listen, this is important. Under the temple, or uh, yeah, underneath the Temple Mount in the old city, and it came out into this Pool of Siloam. The priest would gra- get a gold pitcher, fill it up with water, and with, like, Thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. You guys, this temple mount right here, this flat piece, was 15 football fields in size. 15 football fields full of people, like crammed full of people. People in the streets, people on the sidewalk, everything. And the priest would go with a choir, with cymbals, with drums, with noise, with merriment, and get water from the pool of Siloam, walk it up the hill, go to the temple, go into the courtyard, walk up the ramp to the altar of burnt offering, and then all the crowds have gathered around. And they're yelling, they're, yell, they're singing halal psalms, Psalm 113 through 118. And then they're singing Psalm, they're singing Isaiah 12, verse 3, saying, with joy we will draw from the wells of salvation. And then it even says in, in Isaiah 12, as they quoted this, Yet the Holy One of God is in our midst. Kind of, now, do you see why Jesus is standing up saying, you come to me to drink? See, they're remembering God provided in the wilderness, the joy of water in the wilderness, because the Holy One is in your midst. Jesus is saying, I am the Holy One in your midst, but you must drink of me or you will never be satisfied. Pretty awesome. And then as the high priest, or as the priest had his gold pitcher full of water for the pool of Siloam, he would begin to dump it on the altar of burnt offering, which all the sacrifices had been offered up, and hot coals and ashes and blood and everything. And then the crowd would say, raise your hands, we want to see. And he would pour the water out, and the water would come out, reminding every Jewish person, God provided water in the wilderness for us. For all of those years, abundant Abundant water in the desert. And then all the men with three shofars sounding off in the distance, all the men would say, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. It was quite the scene. And it was right then, as the water was being poured out, that I believe on the last day, the priest had to go seven times around the altar, on the last day, Jesus is standing amongst all this crowd, and he cries out with a loud voice, If anyone thirsts, come to me. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? All week, you spent time and energy and money satisfying yourself. We ate. We clothed ourselves. We bathed, I hope. Uh, We bathed, ate, clothed ourselves. We did all these things, right? And yet we need to do them again, and we're not satisfied. And we're still going to need, as delicious as the meals were, as fun as life might have been this past week, we are still left unsatisfied. We are craving for the rest, which can only be found in Jesus Christ. And he makes this offer, and can I say something? The crowd, for the most part, rejects it. Now, I'm going to give you quickly three groups of people in John 7, and then I'm going to come back and talk about what Jesus said, and then I'm going to give you the application to it. So let's talk about these three groups of people. Why would three groups of people listen to Jesus' voice, hear him, see him, and not believe? 
The first reason is because of familiarity. Just familiarity with spiritual things. Look at John chapter 7 quickly. Verse 3. The Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, now his brothers, this would be James, Jude, and some other brothers and, uh, and sisters. We don't know how many altogether, but he had brothers and sisters from Mary and Joseph's own marriage relationship, Jesus being born of a virgin, right? Mary, when, when, he was, when she was a virgin, conceived Jesus. But he had half-brothers. We know James wrote a book of the Bible. He was a leader in the early church. Jude wrote a book of the Bible. So these brothers, James, Jude, and sisters and others, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. You guys, these brothers, they grew up with Jesus. At 12, if they were young, they would have been younger than 12. They would have seen Jesus at the temple talking to the scribes and Pharisees with authority and amazement. They would have heard the story of Mary and the Magi and the shepherds in Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph would have told over and over the story of Jesus, how the angel Gabriel came to your mother in Nazareth and said, the one born of you is the Holy One of God. But Jesus was born of a virgin. Your mom was a virgin when the baby was born. But you, Joseph, do you see how the, the brothers would have grown up around Jesus? They would have grown up, they would have listened, they would have heard, they would have seen. They would have heard about the wedding in Cana, the water into wine. They would have heard about the nobleman's son. They would, have heard of, they would have heard about the man who was paralyzed at the Pool of Bethesda. But they were so familiar with these spiritual things that their heart was hard. Sometimes people grow up in church, they go to church, they do this, they do that, they do this, they do that, and they are so familiar with spiritual things, but they have no heart. Their heart has never been captured by the grace of God. They have literally have no awe for God because they've been around it their whole time. I was saved when I was 26, and it was awesome. It was a Friday night, and I, I so clearly remember when I trusted in Christ, honestly, it was like my eyes were opened, a lightning bolt, and I was like, I get it. It is the most awesome, spectacular truth, and, and that has not left in, thir in 25 years. It has not left in 20, almost six years now. <laughs> But many, many people just become familiar with spiritual things. They're around spiritual people. They're around the Bible. They go to church often. They sing the songs. They do it over and over and over and over and over and over until finally they are dull and hard-hearted and they don't even care. Do I have to sing one more song about Jesus? Do I honestly have to go to church one more time? Oh, you got to be kidding. More prayer. Another sermon. And they become so hardened and calloused because they have just become familiar with holy, awesome truth. It can happen to any one of us. It happened to the brothers of Jesus. They would not believe in him until after the resurrection. Where is your heart at? Are you so used to the gospel that you've lost the awe of it? I would say do this. I would say take a walk. Take a walk in the woods and really look. Look at things. See things. Be amazed at how God nourishes a tree with roots and then how he uses that in the Bible. Look, look at the sun and, and realize Jesus is the sun of righteousness with healing in his wings. Well, don't look at the sun. Look at the sunrise. Don't get blind. Do you see what I'm saying? But don't ever lose the awe of Christ. When we're flying around, we were high above the clouds I mean, I would just look at the clouds and I'd be like, wow, God, you are awesome. This is nothing to you, God. We're, we're in Port-au-Prince where there's some two million people and there's people driving and walking and doing this and that. And God knows everyone. He knows every thought. He knows what they're going to do. And I'm just like, wow, thank you, God. That's amazing. And then I go to the cross and I picture Jesus Christ hanging on the cross and whatever that experience was like for him, how all my sin was paid in his body, and then I almost begin to tremble and I almost begin to cry. We're up in a voodoo temple, a former temple of voodooism in the mountain of the north, uh, south of Port-au-Prince, and uh, a man shares his testimony. He's a young guy. I don't know how old, but he's a young guy. 
He was, as I told you, high up in the rankings of voodoo priestism and all of that. And three months ago, he is gloriously saved. And to hear him stand in a former voodoo temple and talk about Jesus Christ and salvation, it was like the most incredible thing. Do not ever lose your awe of God. Do not lose your awe of salvation. Do not lose your awe of the cross just because you've heard it a thousand times. Anything that gets repeated over and over and over and over again tends to lose its beauty. Don't, lose, don't ever let its, it lose its beauty. So one reason people don't believe in Jesus, they're so familiar with it all. They've heard it a thousand times, but they've never believed with their heart. They're, they've never come to the understanding of, here's my desperate, desperate spiritual need. I am a sinner, lost and condemned, and Jesus rescued me and saved me through his death and resurrection. And then as a believer, Hebrews 3, 10, in the same context as the wilderness wanderings, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily as it is today. See, do you see, we can fall into the same trap as Israel, you guys. We really can. We can become so familiar with the Bible and so used to doing this over and over that it loses its freshness and its edge and its joy and its beauty. So that's the first group. But look, at there's a second group of people that are also hearing Jesus' words, but they don't believe. It begins in verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast. See, they're curious. They said, where is he? Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Here's another reason why people have unbelief when it comes to Jesus. Not only are they so familiar with spiritual things that loses its edge and fresh freshness, but secondly, they're fearful. Not only familiar, but secondly, fearful. People are fe Listen, people are fearful about what they're going to lose. If I, if I trust Christ, I'm going to lose something in the whole deal. I'm not going to get my own life, my own agenda, my own pleasures. I'm not going to be able to do what I want when I want. I'm going to have to start going to church. I'm going to have to start doing this. And, and you know what? I'm afraid of losing that which I love, which happens to be idolatry. <laughs> so many people refuse to believe in Christ because they are afraid of, in this case, the Jews, of what they're going to lose. They're going to get kicked out of the synagogue, probably lose their business, probably some of their family will reject them. There's a great loss here for these people. They're counting the cost, and they don't want to take the cost. They are afraid of the Jews, and so they will not believe in Jesus. They'll debate his character. Oh, he's good. No, he's not. He's a deceiver. They, they'll debate his, his doctrine. They'll even like argue about the fine points of Scripture, but they will not believe in Jesus. And so sometimes we're afraid, if I follow Jesus, it means giving up my boats and my fishing nets. It means leaving my home and my family, and I've got to be okay with that. He goes on, and he, Jesus goes on, and he says this, verse 14, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and he taught. Remember, the temple is about 15 football fields in size, right up here. Jesus never actually went, I've got another picture, Jesus never actually went into the temple. This was forbidden for even Jesus, the Son of God, to go into. But this right here would have been packed full of people, right here, all of this, packed full of people. And so Jesus goes up to the temple and he's teaching, obviously some awesome truth about salvation and his, his coming in his kingdom. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? Jesus answer, answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself, if you're speaking from yourself, you're seeking your own glory. But he, Jesus says, he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Jesus says, I have been sent from God the Father, and I am without sin. Everything I say glorifies my father, not me. See, he's so different from you and I. Every time we speak, we want to make ourselves look good, don't we? We want to make sure we look good and sound good and impress people. And Jesus says, I have no need for that. My only goal is to glorify my father who sent me. He goes on. He says, uh, verse 19, did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. 
why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, do you have a demon? Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered, and see, when we do not believe Jesus, when we don't trust his words and follow and obey him, really, we get into all sorts of scary areas. When we're not following Jesus, what does that obviously mean? We are following something else. And if we're following anything else, it's going to lead us down all sorts of strange, weird areas. In this case, the people are saying, Jesus, we don't believe your words. We're not following you. You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Although they all wanted to kill them. They all wanted to kill him in their own, in their own minds. Um, and they were even plotting how to do it physically. Verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work. I healed a man on the Sabbath, and you all marvel. Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. Abraham was the first one to circumcise others. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, that was okay for the Pharisees, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely? See, you guys, Jesus says, I healed a man on the Sabbath, gave him a whole new body, and you've got a problem with me. But every Sabbath, when there's some little baby that needs to be circumcised, you guys can give an exception to that rule. You're not, you're not, listen, you're not trusting me. You're not following my word. You're all messed up, is what Jesus says. And, of course, they don't like that. Verse 25, some of them from Jerusalem said, is, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Hey, we know Jesus is from Nazareth, but nobody's really going to know where the Messiah comes from. But see, they didn't know their Bible. They didn't, they didn't know Micah, that the Messiah is going to come from what little village? Bethlehem. Some do, because we're going to find that later in the text. But listen, they don't know his doctrine. They don't know his character. All they want to do is criticize Jesus. So we've got two groups of people so far. Those who are familiar with spiritual things, Jesus' brothers, they want nothing to do with them. And so don't ever get familiar with the gospel and with what's going on here. Don't ever begin to take it casually or to begin to think, wow, I've, I've lost the awe. I've lost the glory and grandeur of it all. Secondly, um, if you're afraid you might lose something in the deal, you'll never follow Jesus. You'll never actually fully believe him because you think he's going to take something that you desperately want. Although if we trust him, he has, he has promised he will give us everything that we need for now and for eternity. There's a third group of people. Look at verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. They're going to arrest Jesus now. So the Pharisees and the scribes, they issue out some soldiers Go get Jesus, arrest him, bring him back, gag him, handcuff him. Do, you guys are the soldiers. Do something. We got to get him off the scene. We got to kill him. We got to get rid of him entirely. All right? Who is this third group of people that will not believe in Jesus? You got the familiar people that are familiar with spiritual things. You got people that are afraid. Here, you have people who are fake. You guys, these Pharisees are just fake people. They say what you want to hear but inwardly, their heart is far from God. You would have looked at any of these Pharisees and thought, man, they should be the pastor of the church. Man, they could be deacons. And yet, when it came to their heart, their heart had no regard for Jesus or holiness, none at all. They wanted the outward to look good, but inward, they were rotting from the core. They were fake. And fake people will never fully trust the Lord, never. So here, the Pharisees want to arrest Jesus. Here's what Jesus says in verse 33. Jesus said to them, I, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him, that's the Father, who sent me. You know what Jesus is, this, remember, this is September or October. Jesus is saying, I'm going to live on this earth a little longer, and then I'm going to go back to the Father who sent me. Six months from now, he's going to be dead and risen from the dead. So Jesus is giving a little prophecy about his death and resurrection. But the Jews, okay, remember how Jesus says one thing, and he, he's talking spiritually, death and resurrection, payment for sin, and everybody is thinking physically in a whole different weird sense. Look at verse 35. Here's how they're saying. Then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go 
that we shall not find him. They're, they're not thinking death on a cross. They're thinking, hey, is Jesus going to a different country? Hey, wait a minute. Did he get a passport? Or did he lose his passport? What did he, wait, now how does Jesus get, where is, he, where is he going that we cannot follow him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you, still, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Again, Jesus is talking death and resurrection. They're thinking, hmm, what hotel is he staying at? And is, is he going under a different name? Is he going to get a haircut? Maybe a beard trim. We'll never recognize him. Maybe he's going to get a pair of glasses. Where is he going that we cannot follow him? See, they don't get it at all. You guys, this is so true of those. And, and my question as we end in just a few minutes, my question is this. Why such unbelief when Jesus is physically standing and speaking to them? Why? Because if we can figure that out, then I think we've got something going for us. And I think the word of God in this text tells us what's going on. And we'll get there in a minute. But, but let's go. Let's keep going. Verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. And he said, if anyone thirsts, if anybody, man, woman, rich man, poor man, it doesn't matter. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. See, that's the invitation. Come to me. Come to a person, Jesus Christ, and drink. He would have been saying this as the priest would have been pouring out that water, and everybody would have known what he was saying. Because, oh, there's so many great texts. And let me just give you a few real quick. Isaiah 44 says this, I will pour out water in the desert, enough to fill rivers and rivers in the desert. And then God says in Isaiah 44, and in the same way, I will pour my spirit upon all my people. So as he pours water in the desert, God says, I will also pour my spirit out upon all people. It's beautiful. In Nehemiah chapter 9, in the text, Nehemiah is celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles with all the nation, and they go to prayer, and as they pray, they say, God, we remember how you gave us bread in the wilderness and water in the wilderness. And you also gave us your good spirit to instruct us. So you have bread, water, and the spirit poured upon the people in the desert. And now the Feast of Tabernacles points to a future day when God doesn't pour physical water on the nation, but the Holy Spirit as many, many, as all Israel is saved. So it's all about spiritual salvation. So Jesus says, you are so worried about the physical. All you care about is the physical. Your next meal, your next thing, your next thing, your next thing, but I'm going to satisfy you with something far deeper. Your greatest need is spiritual. And if, I can, if you will trust me and I can supply your spiritual need, then everything else is going to be provided. True? He will. He'll provide for us physically. It's not a prosperity gospel. He simply will provide for us. We're his children. Will not any good father give to his children in need? Of course. So he cries out, he who believes in me, this is what he means, to come to him and to drink means to believe in him. He who believes, who places their trust in me, in his death and resurrection, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I don't want to get too far off here. Hey, little Bible history question. In the Garden of Eden, there was a river. So the Bible says one river came out of the Garden of Eden, and it split into what? Four rivers. See, out of one river, the dwelling place, see, where God dwells in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, out of one river, it parted, and it, there were four rivers that watered all of the land. Living waters, I believe. Rich living waters that produced the best of vegetation. I bet Adam and Eve just drank out of that living water, and they were refreshed and, and renewed even in the Garden of Eden before sin. In the, in the temple, there's a little, little twiggy stream called the Gihon, tiny little, little bit of water, but it's still it's under the bedrock there. And in the millennial kingdom, Ezekiel chapter 47, what comes from underneath the temple mount, what comes from underneath the temple in the, when Jesus rules and reigns as the savior of the world? A river of life that will flow, and wherever the water touches, it will heal the land. It'll make the Dead Sea full of life again. 
So Jesus says, in the same way, when you trust me, I will give you the Holy Spirit, and deep down in your belly, the Holy Spirit will flow out in an abundance. What does the Spirit produce in our life? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, self-control. Out of our belly, out of our inner being, we are finally going to be loving people, unconditional love. We're going to be joyful people, not based on a circumstance, a situation. I mean, we had many opportunities in Haiti to be discouraged, but that's not a fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't say, hey, I'm going to give you love, joy, peace, and a big wad of discouragement. He says, no, I'm going to give you love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, endurance, self-control, kindness. You'll be, you're going to be kind to one another because out of your belly, out of the very inner being, the Holy Spirit's going to produce a, a boatload of good fruit. However, why don't we see that in believers? I think the source is there, but it's been quenched. It's like you put a plug in it. Shame on us. Okay, let me close with this. You see the three groups of people, the fake ones, the ones that are so familiar with spiritual things, it's lost its coolness and flavor. And then you've got the um, fearful, yeah, those who are afraid of losing something. Go back to this one text here, please, because I'd rather just go, to, go right to this. Go to John 7, 17. Why, why such unbelief, you guys? I'm, I'm, you listen, I'm so concerned about this in my own life and in, 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 in our, our church. John 7, 17 says this. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Jesus is saying, you want to know why so many people don't believe me? They don't want to do God's will. God's will, first of all, is to be saved. Clearly, that's John 4. I have come to do the will of God, the death and resurrection. Jesus says this, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether it's from... Here it is. The words of Jesus are falling on many ears, but only a few believe. Only, and out of the... Listen, out of the few that believe... Very, very few follow because believing is different than following. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a huge group of people, and out of everybody who hears the words of Christ, there's only a few who believe, and out of the few who believe, there's very few who follow. Very, very few. And I think the reason is because we don't get it. We, we, we don't really get what the Bible is saying. Jesus says, if anyone wills to do my Father's will. Here's the tragedy. We go to the Father and we say this. Father, I know you have a will for my life, but I don't want to do it. We don't say this, but this is what we really mean. Father, I know what your will is for my life, but I don't want to do it. I'll, I'll let you have part of my life. I'll let you do this to me. I'll ha I'll let, but if you do, but, but I certainly want to keep this, and I'm not going to let you do that. And I'm gonna, it's going to be an agreement between you and me, and I'm going to get what I want out of the deal, and you can give me whatever leftovers you want, but don't infringe on what I get. It's almost like a check. Like, we're going to give Jesus a blank check for our life, and we're going to say, hey, you know what? I'll have your will for my life, but don't make me witness. Don't make me give. Don't make me sacrifice. Don't make me hurt. Don't make me suffer. Don't make me diseased. Don't do this hey, you can't do this to me because if you do this to me, I'm done following you. I will not do your will then. And listen, if we ever feel like, like I'm not going to do the Father's will, then the word of God becomes closed to us. We have a hard heart. We become desensitized. We begin to think less of, the, of Christ and more of the world, and then everything gets backwards, everything. But when we go to, doing the, when we go to do the Father's will, Jesus never says, hey, tell me what you want. What's going to make a good deal for you, and I'll do my part? He never says that, ever. He says, you want to follow me? You give me your whole self. You abandon yourself. You don't have rights. You don't, have, you don't get to order your life anymore. I, you don't get to tell me where you're going. I'm telling you where to go. I am your master, right? This is a big issue, why do most people not bear abundant fruit of the Holy Spirit? 
How many people do not thrive on God's word and find it a daily blessing because we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'll have you, but I'm going to only have you at this point and for this reason and for this thing. And if I don't get it, you're out of here. I've got my own life to live. But the follower, the true follower of Jesus, like John the Apostle, he said, Jesus, do you want me to get rid of my fishing boat? Okay. Nets? Okay. Leave my family? Okay. I'll follow you. Um, ex exiled to a prison on Patmos? If it be your will. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul? When he, when he signed up for Christianity and Jesus said, Paul, Jesus said, I will, I will show you the things that you will suffer in your ministry. Paul wasn't like this. Oh, Jesus, I'll do your will, but not that, that, or that. But I expect some extra things, too. I want this benefit, this benefit, this benefit. But don't give me this, this, or this. And if you do, if you don't do this, Father, then I'm out of here. You pick somebody else to be the next apostle. He doesn't do that. What does he do? In Acts 20, he says, my life means nothing to myself. If I get bound to going to Jerusalem, so be it. I don't care. I will do the Father's will no matter what it means. If it means being shipwrecked for a day and a half in the deep, fine. If it means I'm in the Philippian jail and, and I'm being beaten with stripes so my back is wide open and then they were crushing my bones with, with rods. If it means in Acts 14, I preach in Lystra and they hate me so bad because I will not be worshipped that they put huge stones and crush my body with stones fracture my skull, break my glasses, and then they drag me outside of the city and leave me for dead? If that's your will, okay, I'll do it. If it means I lose my eyesight and I go to the region of Galatia and they love me so much, they actually, if they could physically, they would pluck their eyes out, Galatians 4.4. If it means I, I have terrible eyesight the rest of my life and I've got to be led around, I'm still yours, Father. I'm still yours. But you know what we get in Christianity today? Oh, I'll serve Jesus as long as it's convenient for me. It's got to fit in my schedule, my time, and it's got to be ordered just like me. And if it's not just like mine, if it's not exactly like this, and it begins to infringe on everything I expect as American citizen, Declaration of Independence, Pursuit of life, liberty, and everything else that goes with it. If it doesn't go into that, then forget it, Jesus. I'm not, I'm not yours. So you've got Jesus' brothers saying, forget it, Jesus. I'm not in. You've got the fearful that say, hey, I'm going to lose my place in the synagogue. Forget it, Jesus. I'm not in. I'm going to lose my business. Forget it, Jesus. I'm not in. You've got the fake spiritual people that are like, but I don't need you, Jesus. I already have religion. I'm already good. I've already done it all. Jesus says, if anyone wills to do my Father's will, then he will know my doctrine. He will know me. And the Spirit of God will be in his belly like rivers of living water bursting forth. And that's the kind of life we want. Do you agree? I wish I could go into other texts. There's so many awesome ones that deal with this. I'm closing my Bible. I'm done. But just kidding. Revelation 22, last thing. In Revelation 22, you guys, right at the end of the book of all the Bible here, um, there's water again. Gushing water from the rock. Um, hey, in Revelation 22, the end of the, the Bible, the entire Bible, it says this. The Spirit of God says... Come. And the bride, who's the bride? The church, says, Come. Interesting that we're going to give the same invitation that Jesus gave at the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to give it to the whole world in the millennial kingdom. The Spirit of God's going to say, Come to the Savior. And then you and I, in glorified bodies, we're going to be like, Come to the Savior. And then it goes on and says, and whoever will, whoever will, drink of the water freely. It's, no, drink of the water of life freely. It's a glorious invitation. And yet, you know what? Most people don't want it. 
Most people don't want the water of life freely. They don't want to give Jesus a blank check saying, hey, I'll do your will no matter what. I will follow you no matter where it takes me. Let's be those kinds of men and women. Thank you, Father, for this text. Thank you for Jesus, his death and resurrection. This book is calling us to follow Jesus. And we see in John 7, the turning, really in John 6, a huge turning point. The crowds are no longer running after Jesus for the latest miracle. They're offended by the message of discipleship. They're offended that Jesus is saying it's him alone. He doesn't He doesn't say him plus any other agenda or plan. It's him alone. He alone has the option or opportunity to to dictate our life. And I fear, Father, that American Christianity is is weak because we want Jesus. We We want him to be a part of our life, but we don't want him to be our life. That's a big difference. May you raise up in this church men and women who are followers of Christ, who will forsake sin, despise sin, hate sin, choose to live godly, holy lives as ambassadors of Christ. Father, may may we remember that salvation is a free gift, bought without price, bought without money, it's abundance. It's awesome. It's, it is the only thing that will satisfy. We will work this week to satisfy different needs in our life. And even if we spent a million years with all the money in the world and every pleasure possible, and we were to fulfill those day after day for a million years, we would still end up empty. For the only thing that will satisfy is Christ. Thank you for this text to remind us not to be men and women of unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For an invitation, we'd like to have you think about this uh, text. And I would say, uh, as, we, as Melissa sings through it and then you join her on the last part of it, um, just take into mind the groups in John 7, the invitation of coming to Jesus Drink of him freely and fully and receive the gift of eternal life and the power and blessing of the Holy Spirit. You are today, but I know that in my own heart, there are things that I cling to and that I am not ready to abandon everything. And yet I think God is calling us and he's warning us of what's out there and he wants us to come to him. Oh, God of mine, I'll have no idols. Oh, God of mine, come lead the way. Oh, God of mine, I'm greatly humbled. This sinner's heart, you came to save. God of mine, through storm and trial, oh God of mine, through death and grave, oh God of mine, in resurrection, your scars display my soul's refrain. Oh, God of mine, who holds all nations. Oh, God of mine, who saves the day. Oh, God of mine, your grace sufficient, your tender mercies new by morn. O oh God of mine, forever faithful, O oh God of mine, forever stay, O 
Oh, God of mine, forever after, these eyes upon your face will gaze. These eyes upon your face will gaze. These eyes upon your face will gaze. Please join with me for that one first verse again. O oh God of mine, I'll have no idols. O oh God of mine, come lead the way. O oh God of mine, I'm greatly humbled. This sinner's heart, you came to say 